Greetings, brethren, sisters, ladies, gentlemen, friends, enemies, whoever is predestined to turn this on. How many times do we see videos and conversation in all our daily walk in life? People talk about God and how wonderful God is. That God is the, I, I believe in God. I, I want to worship God. I mean, they just go on and on. Let me tell you something. Just because a person talks about God doesn't mean they know the true and the living God. It's an important thing to realize that mankind wants to have a God. But it's a God of his own making. It's a God by which he can control, corral, corner, plead with, cry to, beg from, but it's not a God who rules, it's not the God that reigns. It is not the God who controls. Oh, he may say that God created everything, his God. But his God's not the God of the Bible. His God, their rock is not as our rock. If God's a rock, their rocks, not as our rock. If we're his, that's the important thing. You know, it says in the scripture that in Second John, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. So there's what we got to judge by. You want to say you know God? What think ye of Christ is the test to try both your state and your scheme. You cannot be right in the rest unless you think rightly of him. That's how the hymn writer put it. I believe it was Joseph Hart. I'd commend Hart's hymns to you, even if you don't sing. Just reading the poetry is absolutely beautiful. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. It's very important that we know what the doctrine of Christ is then, isn't it? Let's just, for a moment, and I don't want this to be very long if the Lord wills, think of that word Christ. What does it mean? It's not Jesus' last name. We know that. If we begin this with just a simple definition, Christ, what does it mean? It's a transliteration of the Greek word Christos, and it simply means the anointed one. We're reading the prophecies of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee, though all above thy fellows.
He was anointed. The Spirit was poured out upon him. It rested on him like a dove. When he came up out of the water, after being baptized by John. If I may rephrase that, after being dipped by John. So the doctrine of Christ, first and foremost, means that he is God's anointed. That God anointed him for a particular reason. Let's go back in the Old Testament and let's look and see who was anointed. The first that we gather under the law were priests were anointed, weren't they? Were anointed with oil. Poured down on them. Next, kings. Go back and read the story of Saul. And more importantly, the story of David. How Samuel went and anointed them. So we have the anointment of the prophet, or the priest, excuse me, and an anointing of the king. I will submit to you that Jesus' anointing was to put both in one, authorized for the first time by God. Read in the book of Zechariah how he's a king and a priest, and he shall sit on the throne of his glory as both. In fact, let's just, let's just read that little section because it is important. To knowing about the anointing. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now, if we look at the context of Zechariah, Zechariah is prophesying here during the time of the rebuilding of the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. So it's obvious the Lord isn't talking about that temple, is he? Because this man, whose name is the branch, shall build the temple of the Lord, and more than that, he shall bear the glory. Now, here's where we are. and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Now who sits and rules on the throne but the king? And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Tell you what, brother, and I've heard some Calvinists talk about the council of peace and all that. The council of peace is between the king and the priest. It's within the person of Jesus Christ that the peace is. No more warfare between king and priest. No more antagonism between a wicked king and a glorious priesthood or a godly king and a wicked priesthood. No, the council of peace is between both them shall be between them both, the priest and the ruler, united in one. 
So if this branch is a prophecy of Jesus, which we certainly believe it is, then part of the doctrine of Christ is that he is a priest authorized by God to make sacrifice for the sins of someone. Isn't that what priests did in the Old Covenant, under the Old Law? They offered sacrifices. They burned incense. They did all that was commanded in the Law because that's what God authorized them to do. They did it for a specific people at specific times and for specific purposes. So here comes our high priest, our great priest, our king priest. And he's born. And he grew up out of his place. And the root of Jesse, seed of David, there he was. Think about that for just a moment. And he is the son of God. Though he was born of the virgin, he is the son of God. He is, his flesh is not corrupted as is yours, mine, and all who have been born since Adam. It's perfect. It's tempted in all points like as we are. Can you believe that? It's always been hard for me to believe. All the myriads of sins that are out there in the world Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we. Scripture says it. It must be true. Yet without sin. See, you and I, we'd be tempted. And there are times when, by the word of Christ, power of the Spirit, we're able to overcome a temptation. But you know, next week, next day, next hour, the same thing might come to us and we fall under it. He never did. Because of the perfection of his flesh. So what's he going to sacrifice? Under the law, you sacrificed turtle doves, lambs, rams, all different things, red heifers, ashes. But Hebrews tells us none of those things could put away sin. Neither could they make the comers there unto perfect. Had to be offered again and again priest couldn't sit down. He had to make his sacrifice, make intercession for the people every year. But this man, this priest, could offer no greater sacrifice than the sacrifice of himself. The perfect flesh that came from God. He offered it for the sins of his people. Just like the sacrifices under the old law were offered for the nation of Israel, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was offered for the sins of the true Israel. Not the typical one. Not the natural one. First comes the natural, then comes the spiritual. Remember that. The 
So here we are. We've got a savior. We've got an anointed priest. And this anointed priest is getting ready to make his offering. And the offering's going to be himself. So what does he do? He becomes obedient to death, even to the death of the cross. That's something, isn't it? Obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Why did he do it? Because he loved his people with an everlasting love. They were given to him by his father. And he covenanted to redeem them and bring them back to himself. You know, sometimes when I think about these things, I can't comprehend all the ins and outs, the whys and wherefores. There's no way we can know them all. Why would you do that, brethren? Would you, if you could? Would you die a horrendous death? that others might live? He did. But let's go on here. As priest, he offered the sacrifice. The heavenly flesh was sanctified, pured, pure. And it was scourged, beaten, Nailed to the tree. But it was not destined to stay there. Let's stop for just a moment on the priest and let's look at the king just one second. So. Here's this branch as we said born of a virgin made of a woman made under the law yet his disciples would look at him and say look at each other and say who is this that even the wind and the sea obeys him I mean he could sit there and speak to the winds and the waves and they be calm he could come to a possessed person and tell that demon to get out of them, or demons, and they left. They didn't question him. They didn't say, we're not going to do that. They left. Disease healed. You know, all of that was done to show his power and his authority, if I might be so bold, his kingly authority over all creation. He was the creator. Scripture tells us he created all things by Jesus Christ. nothing for the creator to say stop there's nothing for the creator to say come there's nothing for the creator to say go the old centurion knew that didn't he he said lord i'm not worthy for you to come under my roof but i'm a man under authority when i tell this one you go this one you come 
Well, they don't argue, they do it. You can command that disease out of my daughter from here. And he did. But his kingship was fully realized and manifested at the resurrection and ascension. You see, when Jesus sacrificed himself, well, let's go back. All the animals that were sacrificed under the law, not a one of them ever got their life back. They were all consumed. In fact, that was the food for the priest and sometimes for some of the people. Jesus, however, could not be holding a death. Why do our bodies die? The body is dead because of sin. He had no sin. Therefore, though he gave up the spirit, gave up the ghost, death could not hold him. And by his power and the power of the Father, he was raised again after three days and three nights in the tomb. I'll let you figure out all the math, but guarantee if he was raised on the first day of the week and the first day of the week Sunday, he didn't go in that tomb on Friday. So that's neither here nor there. But when he rose from the dead, the priestly work was over. The priestly work was accepted. The sacrifice turned away the wrath of God. And now he taught them. Taught them for a short time. Came to them, showed himself alive. And then he ascended. He said, I go to my father and to your father. He went up in the clouds. What happened then? He was seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. He must reign. He's showing forth his kingship. He was king for, from the beginning. But now he shows it by upholding all things with the word of his power. It's a marvelous scripture to me. He upholds all things. Not by his power, but by the mere word of his power. And I'll digress a little right here. One of the most important things in showing forth his kingship was the destruction of Jerusalem as he predicted in Matthew 24, in Luke, in Mark, where it's all recorded. And he came with clouds directing the forces that fought against the Jews at that time. So this is the doctrine of Christ. The Christ, uh, this is part of it at least. I'm not saying it's all of it. I'm saying though it is part of it. If any man come to you that has not the doctrine of Christ, has not God. You can't have the true and the living God without having the son of his love. There's a lot more to it than this. I'm just giving you a couple of brief things here and maybe we'll be blessed to continue some of it a little later on the doctrine of Christ. But that first thing is the important thing is what is a Christ what set him apart from all the others he was the anointed one he was the Messiah he was the sin bearing priest and he was the royal king
Anybody comes not comes to you not having that. And let me tell you something. When we talk about a sin-bearing priest, I'm talking about real sin-bearing. I'm not talking about making something possible, probable. I'm talking about him actually bearing the sins, every sin, that every one of his people will commit. Now, if you want to join with the Arminian world and say that Christ died for every sin of every man on this earth, then every man's sin is put away and universalism reigns, and that's well and good. If you want to believe that, more power to you. I, I want you to take it and run with it. There's a bunch of primitive Baptists. They used to call them no-hellers. Now they're honest and say we're primitive Baptist universalists. Join them. Unite with them. Or else join with the Arminians, say Christ didn't die for sin at all. He made salvation possible, but, you know, he just kind of did some kind of mumbo-jumbo and, and it really didn't amount to anything because you still have to do something. I believe with the old school predestinarian Baptist, the old primitive Baptist, not this old lying garbage, that the old predestinarians, the old school, that Christ died for a people. He died for every sin that every one of them would ever commit. Period, exclamation mark, write it down, grave it in brass, put it with a pen of iron upon the rock. It doesn't matter. He did it. And every one of those for whom he died will be saved. Housed in heaven and immortal glory forevermore. And I'm going to go one step further and end with this. And every one of them, from the least to the greatest, infant, idiot, adult, it doesn't matter, every one of them will believe in him. And will know him. They'll not be found in the temples of Vishnu. They'll not be found dancing before Krishna. They will not be praying to Allah in a the mosque. They will know him. And they will know the truth. And the truth will make them free. Now did I say that every one of them could express it correctly? Maybe even express it the way we'd like them to? Well, probably not. But I guarantee you every one of them, when they die, and they are ushered into the presence of the Lord, they'll not be wondering who that is on the throne. They'll know it's Jesus. And they'll know it was his blood that died, that was shed for them. Because they knew it before. Now did I say that every one of those folks was going to hear a preacher? Be it an Arminian missionary or an old school Baptist? No, I did not. Because we're not necessary for the salvation of sinners. God can reveal it to the man plowing in the field just as much as he can to the man in the meeting house listening to the reading of the scriptures. I leave you with this anecdote told by Thomas Dudley. One of the members of his church, one of his churches, had gone to hear a minister of a different order of Baptist. Primitive Baptist, actually. The old school Baptist. This was when the means controversy first started. 
And he said, well, sister, I heard you went to hear Elder so-and-so. How was it? She said, well, he read some scripture, and that was all right. It was all right. He said, well, didn't you get anything out of it? She said, yes, he, he read some scripture, and that was a comfort, but that, you know, that's it. He said, you mean he, and she interrupted him and said, Elder Dudley, when I go out to the spring house, to get some milk out of the can. If there's a speck in that milk, I pluck it out and draw my milk and go back. She said, but if I go to that can and there's a dead rat floating in it, I pour it all out. So there you go, brethren. May the Lord bless us to pour it out or pick out the speck. May he give us grace and wisdom to understand the difference and when it should be done. And I thank you.